On September 28th, a Cessna 340 registered as November 269. Whiskey Tango crashed less than a mile from David Wayne Hooks Memorial Airport near Houston, killing both people on board. The weather was nearly perfect. Clear skies, calm winds. Yet, this twin-engine aircraft, flown by a highly experienced 74-year-old pilot, never climbed higher than a few hundred feet before cartwheeling into a field. So how does something like this happen under ideal flying conditions? Let's see what we've got. The airplane in question was a 1972 Cessna 340, tail number November 269 Whiskey Tango. If you're not familiar with it, this isn't your run-of-the-mill piston twin. The 340 is a pressurized cabin-class aircraft comfortable for passengers, but not at all forgiving for inexperienced pilots. It demands attention, discipline, and a lot of training. To really handle it well, you need hundreds of hours in complex aircraft and a strong foundation in twin engine performance. It's not a step-up trainer. It's the kind of airplane you buy after you've mastered the basics and want something more capable. What makes it unique is also what makes it tricky. The most talked about feature right now is the clamshell air stair door. It's a two-piece design, an upper section and a lower stair portion that's secured by six locking pins backed up by a safety pin and chain. Pilots can verify the latching through small inspection ports and there's even a warning light on the annunciator panel if the door isn't secured. Sounds foolproof, right? But here's the catch. If something slips through that chain of safety checks, the upper door can pop open in flight. And when it does, you get a loud bang, disturbed airflow, and a whole lot of distraction in the cockpit. The 340 also has a forward baggage door on the nose, right by the left engine and propeller. Normally, if that door opens, it's not catastrophic, but if baggage comes loose, it could get sucked into the prop arc, and that's extremely frustrating for any pilot to even imagine. The real lesson here is that complexity is a double-edged sword. This airplane was designed for serious aviators, but it demands steady hands and calm reactions. Even something as minor as a door warning becomes a test of discipline. Let's walk through what we know about the accident sequence. The Cessna had just been topped off with fuel, so it was taking off heavy. At around 12.08 p.m. local time, it departed David Wayne Hooks Memorial Airport. Reports about its destination vary. Some sources mention a waypoint called Lick. Others suggest it was heading toward Lubbock. That detail hasn't been clarified yet, but what matters is that the airplane never got very far. Almost immediately after liftoff, the pilot radioed ATC to report that something was wrong. That phrase alone is chilling. He didn't specify an engine issue, just that something wasn't right. A DSB data fills in the picture. At just two or three hundred feet above the ground, the pilot banked into a tight right turn. That's a very low altitude to be maneuvering aggressively. The airplane never climbed higher than about 700 feet, and it never built much speed. The highest recorded airspeed was around 96 to 97 knots, with the final data point showing 75 knots, dangerously close to stall speed for a pressurized twin like this. The track shows the airplane overshooting final, then trying to correct with a steep turn back, and that's where it lost control, crashing into a field about half a mile short of the runway. Witnesses describe the wreckage as fully engulfed, with brush fires quickly spreading before fire crews got it under control. One more important piece, authorities have said there's surveillance video of the accident. That footage hasn't been released to the public, but you can bet investigators will be combing through it frame by frame. Video like that can confirm attitudes, engine sounds, and even control inputs that ADSB alone can't show. Now, let's talk about what might have set this whole chain in motion, the door. Early reports suggest the pilot had a door open situation shortly after takeoff. Now, if you've flown or studied cabin class twins, you'll know that a door coming ajar in flight usually looks and sounds dramatic, but in reality, it's not supposed to be catastrophic. In the Cessna 340, 
The upper half of that clamshell door can pop open, but the manuals are clear. Keep your speed up, fly a stabilized approach, and bring it back around to land. In fact, most training programs emphasize not to panic because the airplane remains perfectly flyable with that door open. The real problem is the human reaction. A sudden bang, airflow noise, maybe a vibration. It's startling. At a few thousand feet, it's an annoyance. But at just a few hundred feet off the ground, that distraction can pull your attention away from the only thing that matters, keeping the airplane flying. And here's where things get really concerning. Instead of climbing to a safe altitude and setting up a normal return, the data shows the pilot turned tight, stayed low, and let the airspeed bleed away. Add in the fact the aircraft was heavy from full fuel, and those margins were razor thin. Low speed, steep angles, heavy airplane. It's a perfect recipe for loss of control in flight. And that's exactly the kind of trap we've seen in other accidents with open door distractions. Now, before we get carried away with speculation, let's take weather off the table. And honestly, that's one of the more frustrating parts of this crash. It didn't happen in marginal conditions. Pilots often fight wind shear, turbulence, storms, poor visibility, but not here. On September 28th, the skies were clear. Visibility stretched to 10 miles, and the winds were barely moving. Just four knots. Variable. It was as close to ideal as you can get for flying. And the airport itself? David Wayne Hooks has a 7,000-foot paved runway. Plenty of length for a safe return, especially if the pilot had chosen to climb, settle down, and set up a straight-in. The elevation is only about 152 feet. The terrain around is flat, and there weren't significant obstacles in the approach path. Even the Class B shelf overhead didn't kick in until 2,000 feet, so there was plenty of vertical space to climb if needed. In other words, the environment wasn't the limiting factor. The real focus shifts back inside the cockpit, the mechanical systems, the pilot workload, and the decisions made in those tense seconds after liftoff. This brings us to the heart of the discussion, where early analysis meets unanswered questions. Let's start with performance. The Cessna 340 isn't forgiving if you let the airspeed slip. You've got stall speed, VMC, and VYSE, the so-called blue line, all sitting there as hard boundaries. Based on ADS-B, the airplane was flying between about 75 and 97 knots. That is an extremely narrow margin, especially when you're banking steeply at low altitude. It leaves almost no buffer. So what else might have been at play? A few things investigators are going to look at closely. Configuration. Was the gear down? Were the flaps extended? Both add drag, which could explain the difficulty building speed. Autopilot. Was it engaged? Sometimes, autopilot logic fights the pilot, especially right after takeoff if modes aren't set properly. Engines. Was there a power issue? Propeller blades and engine components will show whether both engines were producing thrust at impact, weight and balance. With full fuel, the aircraft was heavy, and CG position matters in climb performance human factors. This pilot was 74. Experience is valuable, but age can affect reaction time, decision-making under stress, and how someone responds to startle events. And then there's the evidence. Investigators will inspect the door latches and pins, check whether the enunciator bulb filament burned in flight, and analyze baggage door integrity. They'll examine props for rotational scoring, confirm flight control continuity, and match ADSB data with ATC audio. Most importantly, that surveillance footage from David Wayne Hooks Memorial Airport could be the smoking gun, showing attitudes, angles, and maybe even engine performance at the final moments. The bigger picture here is unsettling. We've seen multiple accidents where a relatively minor cockpit anomaly, a door opening, spirals into disaster. Not because the airplane couldn't fly, but because distraction led to rushed, low-altitude returns. That pattern is extremely frustrating to see repeat, but to be clear, we won't know for certain whether this was mechanical, procedural, or human factor driven until the NTSB completes its work. So here we are, a capable airplane, good weather, a seasoned pilot, and yet a tragic outcome. November 269, Whiskey Tango is another reminder of how even the smallest abnormality in the cockpit 
can escalate under pressure. The fact that this happened under blue skies makes it all the more puzzling and all the more important for investigators to dig into the details. And now I want to ask you, when you hear about crashes like this, what do you think is the most overlooked factor? Is it the mechanics of the airplane, the human reaction in the cockpit, or the crushing workload that can hit right after takeoff? Drop your thoughts in the comments below because this one really raises some hard questions.